from the U.S. Um, they need us to stay home, uh, but nobody mm -hmm. wants to. But look at that. That's yeah. pathetic. Yeah. And, the, and the overall figures are kind of leveling out, uh, you know, the flat line. Um, so, yeah, just the big pocket of uh, uh, infection, like red spots, or if you, if you want to call it, is Sydney. Um, because Sydney is also quite congested, very similar to like a New York scenario where people are kind of living on top of each other. Um, and not eating curry. <laughs> not eating yeah, curry. Not eating enough curry. <laughs> because the, the same thing with Sydney is if you walk on a Sydney street in the CBD, Central Business Central District Street. in Sydney, if you take a walk or stroll down the, uh, the street, uh, for every 20 person you go past, 16 of them would be from China. Wow. You know, they're just disproportionate. Like, yeah. that's, that's not the case in India. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm not saying this. Uh, it might on be in America or maybe in uh, Australia or maybe somewhere, but it's not the case in India. We have so many Indians around the world. Apart from India, so I think we are good. good to well, there are not yeah. that many green vegetables in the Chinese diet. I'm not sure about uh, Chinese diet, but I know that we use a lot of vegetables and we use a lot of spices and oils and a lot of mm -hmm. things. In our, uh, I, I think mean, it's spices. I, I mean, think a spicy life is a good life. And I, I heard the, the word <laughs> apple from one of you. So apples are my favorite. Right. So, not a big deal in China, though. Fruits and vegetables no. are not uh, real. Really no. I the there's, a Chinese, there's a Chinese meal they call yam cha. Yamcha, like in the mornings, they're going to do yamcha yeah, yeah. kind of thing. I, yeah. I have not been to one, so I cannot verify what it is. So, but you know, I go past and I just look at the photos on the uh, shop front, and uh, there's nothing green there. It's all like it's kind right. of a, it's kind of a tea, uh, I mean, uh, tea, tea flavors with uh, different. Uh, I mean, it's like uh, different uh, flavors of mojito in the form of a tea, and uh, a lot of other fruits uh, mixing with the tea. So, a lot of Chinese are following those uh, yamcha kind of. Uh, Recipes. Yeah. So I would like to ask the doctor. Like, uh, Blueberry. Uh, Transplants going around during this uh, COVID-19 uh, as well. So what kind of precautions you are following, uh, do, I mean, while undergoing these transplants uh, at your hospital? Well, you see, uh, the transplant activity was uh, at a standstill. And this was in accordance with the uh, government guidelines that the advisory was to uh, halt the the transplant activity till the time uh, we have more clarity on the issue. So, so we haven't been doing any transplants of late. I would say for the last about three weeks, barring an exception, whereby we just did one about a couple of uh, days ago, whereby a family was uh, really uh, committed uh, and wanted to donate the organs of their uh, relative who was declared brain dead, and that is what actually. The enthusiasm of the family, what, that is what uh, um, encouraged us to seek a special permission from the governmental agency, and then we went ahead. So, so the liver was accepted, two kidneys were accepted, um, and I think that was it. But uh, at least the, so far, it's just been about three days. The outcome has been quite good. But otherwise, uh, there was an advisory which said that um, till the time we are clearer as to how this virus is going to behave, uh, we should not be uh, uh, doing any transplantations. For this one, as you asked me, we took a lot of precautions. And, and the precautions, on one hand, we wanted to be 100% sure that the, the prospective donor did not have COVID-19. And we did the test twice from the endotracheal secretions. And then the recipients, because for every one kidney, we, we uh, call about four or five uh, uh, potential recipients for these two kidneys we had almost like seven eight of them and each one of them was tested uh, for covid19 uh, twice over a period of uh, within 24 hours i would say and that's actually uh, for their safety as well as the safety of the healthcare providers because uh, the doctors attending on to them the staff the the nurses technicians everyone would be at risk if they were uh, having uh, an asymptomatic COVID-19 disease. So, but this is, I would believe, only a short-term 
kind of uh, situation. Ultimately, there are people who are waiting. Uh, we have uh, plenty of them who were about to be transplanted within that week when the government called for the lockdown and they are eagerly awaiting their uh, uh, turn for the transplantation. I'm talking about, as you know, predominantly in our country, it's the uh, living related uh, kind of uh, uh, kidney uh, donation rather than the cadaveric, which is prevalent in uh, most of the other parts of the world. Unfortunately, uh, it's about 90% uh, the family donors and just about 10% uh, coming from uh, the cadaveric donors. So here, the patients are all set to undergo transplantation, but unfortunately, the prevailing circumstances is not giving anyone the kind of confidence which one needs for uh, going ahead with uh, the uh, uh, difficult surgery such as renal transplantation or for that matter any any transplantation and also as uh, today so was uh, discussing about the stem cell research and how stem cell can be a part of uh, a kidney treatment uh, we were expecting dr you and dr bill to join us but unfortunately they are not able to join us so what do you think uh, dr Fuller, about stem cell research and uh, how stem cell could uh, change the uh, way kidney uh, I mean, patient uh, survive? Well, uh, you see, uh, I, I'll, I'll give you some statistics again here, and, and I'll limit myself again to the Indian statistics. Every right. year, it is believed that about 200,000 people land up in a stage, what is called as end-stage kidney disease, and now they're going to uh, require either dialysis or transplantation. Now, just about... 25,000 people uh, can actually manage uh, uh, dialysis in our country. And just about 8,000 kidney transplantations are performed every year across the country. Now, don't ask me what happens to the remaining almost more than 150,000 people because cost is a huge issue. The affordability, the availability of the treatment is, is a big issue. And looking at the, the big numbers, so we, we simply want our patients not to reach the stage of end-stage renal disease, and we could uh, hopefully do something before that. I mean, what we are typically referring to is repair of the kidneys. And now with that in mind, the stem cell therapy always has had a lot of optimism. But unfortunately, so far, we don't have a definite or a concrete evidence that this uh, helps, as at least as of today in 2020. We are, we are very, very eagerly looking forward to uh, something positive coming out of it, even though the research so far has been a little disappointing, but in everyone's heart, we are strongly believing that uh, in times to come, we will have something good coming out of it. And I would certainly, um, I was actually looking forward to hearing uh, um, from experts like Dr. Yu and Dr. Bill, and in their absence, uh, if I if I may ask Dr. Uh, uh, David Moskowitz, what is his take on something which is theoretically highly promising? I mean, I mean, for the sake of the viewers, we are we are talking about uh, a stem cell therapy whereby you are making some pluripotent cells uh, grow in a particular direction, and you can you can have uh, new cells which actually can repair the kidney and and. There are a few definitions, and, and, and again, at the same time, I would like to, um, before I hand it over to Dr. David, some controversies, because, because earlier on, earlier on, oh, Dr. Bill, so you just at the right time, we were, I was about to try and, uh, and explain as a non-expert about stem cell therapy, but let me finish before I hand it over to you and Dr. David. See, there was some, some um, controversy when we wanted to take these cells from the blastocyst or the embryo, there were some ethical issues. And now the experts like Dr. Bill and Dr. Yu are, are going one step ahead. They are, they are uh, modifying these somatic cells, one's own cells, which there are plenty of them, and there are no ethical issues involved here. You you uh, engineer them, tailor them into the stem cells. So so there is no going to be no controversy. But whether that translates into something meaningful uh, or not, I think only time is going to tell. So so far, it's more of optimism, hope. Over to you, Dr. David, first, and then finally to Dr. Bill. Well, it, it, very quickly, it's a hot potato for me. I'll give it to Dr. Bill right away because I know nothing about stem cells. 
Oh, no, no, don't say that. Everybody knows about stem cells these days. <laughs> Everybody knows that they should pay their taxes to the Stem Cell Institute. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so that's why we're having this talk show. We're going to educate the world on stem cells and not to be afraid of it. Because if you had the facts, you don't have fear. When you have knowledge of something and, and knowledge is very powerful, you don't fear it. And up until now, people either feared it or thought it fake. But let's let's figure this out and share the knowledge. I still think it's fake. So over what, to that. What was the conversation? I heard that uh, some of you guys are experts in dialysis. Uh, well, Dr. Dinesh is. I see. I know uh, enough about dialysis to want to prevent it. Dr. Kula, are you in Delhi? Yeah, I'm, I'm from Delhi. And what I was referring to was that for a country like mine, where you have almost like 200,000 people added every year to, to uh, who land up in end-stage kidney disease, where the treatment options are either dialysis or transplantation. And certainly, uh, if, if the develop, developed countries are finding it uh, uh, quite difficult to cope up with this kind of economic uh, pressure. Uh, so, so you can imagine what is happening to a developing country like mine. So obviously, I would want the kidney um, disease process to be halted at, done, at some stage so that the disease does not progress towards end-stage renal disease. So we are looking at some kind of repair of the kidney. So I'm not talking about the other organs, limiting myself as a nephrologist to what stem cells could do to, to the kidneys. So, so I totally agree with Dr. David here that yes, so far, we don't have data which suggests that they, they, they are doing miracles. Theoretically, yes, it looks very exciting. And, and we are wanting to, to hopefully have something come out uh, of it in a, in a positive manner. So that's why we want to hear to experts like you. Who uh, tell Dr. Kuller, uh, Dr. Kuller, let me, I think a couple of days back, I went over this, uh, basic 101 on stem cells um, let's let's go back on that uh, I think it'll be, it'll be very interesting to see where we are going with this whole process you know when we have conception we have a 16 or 22 or 120 cell um, mass like a bunch of grapes um, I personally believe that at that time, there is no soul in those, they're just cells. Uh, after division and after division, and on day four or five, I believe that this whole process stops for about 24 hours. Now, what happens during that time, uh, I believe that this, these cells, 120 cells are reprogrammed to make the endoderm, ectoderm, and all that three layers of the embryo. And they are designated to make, in nine months, the whole human body. Now, if we believe that that is true, the process that stem cells, 120 stem cells, mother cells, can make a human body. And then when the baby is born, most of these cells are transferred to the baby. Uh, and it grows with them. They localize into different tissues as adult stem cells, not the, not, not the embryo is left behind now. Now they become adult stem cells. They don't have the same capability as the embryonic cells, but they're pretty good. They still can make, uh, re regenerate the whole tissue based on the microenvironment we provide them. Now, as you notice that I'm, you know, as a physician, I'm sure uh, even even a layman can understand when we are in our early 20s uh, or our teens, when we fall, we break our leg or, or break a bone, bruise, we heal very quick. But as we grow old, that process declines and it's very difficult to repair. Sometimes in the old age, we hardly repair any bones. Now, what's the difference here? If you look at the, the whole timeline of uh, aging, earlier on, you have so many adult stem cells being produced. We, we lose about 300 million cells per minute in our body. But the body, those adult stem cells that have been localized in our tissue, bone marrow and other tissues, we know they're everywhere now. They make about 
300 billion progenitor cells. They replace the dying blood cells, they replace the dying tissue cells to regenerate the body. Now, the difference between when we are in our teens versus when we are old is that these cells lose their ability to regenerate due to many factors, age, the age as well, toxicity build up in the body. And also when that process happens around about in our early thirties, since the process shifts a little bit, you know, more cells being uh, dead than made, or the, the, the balance really changes. So what happens is these dead cells keep on accumulating in the body. It's like if you put a rotten strawberry in a bowl of fresh strawberries, it will start killing the rest of them. It will rot the others too. So exactly those dying and dead cells produce certain factors that start killing the cells surrounding them. And they become kind of foam cells. They, they're half dead, half uh, alive. So that process keeps on uh, adding on to our old age. That's what we get wrinkles and all that chronic conditions. So just imagine that if I come along and say, look, you know, I have a source of uh, stem cells. I can transfuse in your body uh, 300 million cells every three months. Tell me if there is any reason to believe why we would not behave like when we were 16. There's no reason to believe. We can, we can be 200 year old, but we would, our physiology would work the same way. So based on that principle, I believe that every disease can be treated in the body. Every regenerative function can be reinstated if we have the right cell. What's missing here is we do not have good cells in the body when we grow old and we do not, do not have good cells commercially available to us all you're getting is all these little shops open you know uh, pizza shops you know they they really don't have live stem cells they're giving you garbage they're taking your money and they're not giving you any stem cells we have tested close to about 12 or 15 different commercial preparations zero live stem cells if you talk to them, they say, well, you don't need live cells there. It's all the paracrine function. The, the cells produce, life, stem cells produce factors, all the cytokines, and they do the regenerative function. Even the guy who named them mesenchymal stem cells came around that these are the drug producing factories. So they should be, you know, not even called mesenchymal stem cells. Now, uh, I don't believe that. And I have a very good example to prove that that is not true. I was telling them a story about 14 years ago, there was a gentleman from America, he went to Germany, he picked up HIV infection. So he went to his doctor in Germany and he put him on antiretrovirals. And you know, two years later, he developed acute leukemia because that is one of the side effects of the antiretrovirals. So this guy is now stuck. He, he, they can't control his virus. He has now at the top of that has leukemia. So they sent him back to California and then lucky, he was very lucky. He, they found a bone marrow match for him. They did two transfusions. And after second transfusion, he, they cured his leukemia. He'd been free of leukemia now for 14 years. But Dr. Kuller, what also happened, which is very fascinating uh, aspect of it, they also cured his HIV. Now, can you believe that how they did that? It's the stem cells. Now, stem cells can cure infectious conditions. There is no doubt about it. And I believe uh, that COVID can also be taken care of with stem cells. Now, let's go back to the, to the source of the cells that he got 14 years ago. The guy was HIV resistant. So how does the HIV resistance come about? HIV resistance is due to lack of a receptor on the cells that the virus uses to enter and, and home and multiply and kill the cell. That called, receptor is called CCR5. Now that guy has the resistant, uh, HIV resistance because of lack of that CCR5. So those cells went into this guy 
who had developed leukemia and HIV. Now, unless those cells were alive for 14 years, there is no other way to explain that he will be virus free because those cells have to be alive, provide his body a CCR5 negative cell population. There's no other mechanism. If there was another mechanism like factors, we would have cured HIV long ago. So same way, I think the stem cells can work for COVID. COVID requires a, a AC2 receptor to get into the cell. The, the, the spike protein binds to the cell and the uh, lung tissue and then uh, does the job, whatever it does, all the pathology. Now, if we can have stem cells that do not have AC2 receptor, we should be able to uh, to cure or, or or get get rid of the virus if we can transfuse enough stem cells which are AC2 negative because they will produce progenitor cells, maybe repopulate the lung. Uh, stem cells do that if if they are delivered properly. I think it, it, it's curable. It, it, stem cells should work. Same thing for kidney. Now, if we diagnose the so long as the kidney is not 90, 98% gone, so long as there is some, um, some kidney function left, I think it can be regenerated, provided you put in the right way, the right stem cells. So it, it, it is a strong possibility, but right now, we are, the limiting factors are availability of good stem cells. And the understanding by the physicians how to deliver them because they're, they're really not trained. Most of us are from an age when there were no stem cells. We did not know about them. And now we are beginning to understand how these stem cells work. And we should have more training for physicians, nephrologists, cardiologists. And uh, because a lot, of the, a lot of the people, they say, okay, you know, you have stem cells. Uh, I don't think they have stem cells, first of all. Two, they say, okay, I'll, I'll give an IV injection. They will go to the, to the right area and the cardiac tissue. No, they don't. Because if the cells are to begin with dead, they're going to get trapped in the lung and eliminated. Lung is a filter. But the only way these cells would cross that barrier is if they are alive. They can kick around and, and move out. Because that's what happens with the with when you have your own stem cells produced in the body, they go and circulate everywhere. They reach the target but perfectly well. And there are not many numbers. They go there home and multiply and produce all the factors. So I personally believe that all this can be done provided we have the right uh, stem cell population and the right methodology to, to deliver them. So if I may ask Dr. Bill, wh why do you think, uh, or what do you think is the main reason why it has not been able to make too much of an impact so far? Because we've been hearing about the promises which uh, stem cell therapy could bring in uh, for almost like more than two decades. Okay, so why let me tell you why. It... My personal belief is that why we are, we're failing is number one. The embryonic stem cells, when we started producing them, they had the major capability of regeneration, regenerative function. But due to religious re reasons, political reasons, we put a tab on them. We cannot work with embryonic stem cells. But especially in the US, and I think India also in 2017, they uh, passed an ordinance that you cannot work with uh, embryonic stem cells. Um, I'm sure you've heard the name Gita Sharoff. Uh, she was using it, violating the ordinance, and she was shut down. And uh, she had some good progenitor cell populations that I think personally believe that she may have some. Uh, so, so, so what we learned from that ban on embryonic stem cells is that these cells are also everywhere else in the body. So you could you could isolate them from umbilical cord. Let's let's go go to umbilical cord. If you take one unit of umbilical cord, the most you can produce is about 250 to 300 million cells from that 
that you hold water and jelly, blood and the tissue. Now, if, if a patient requires about 150 to 200 million cells, single unit of cord will provide only one patient. It's not an economically viable pop proposition for the, for the manufacturer. So they, what they do is they cut corners. They, they will give you, they say, whatever the tissue cells are, dead cells are, they make it 35, 40 million cells and say, okay, you know, these are stem cells. They are not, they're selling them as total nucleated cells. They, the the mesenchymal population is only less than 0.1%. And it's not going to do anything. So that is one reason of the failure. With the embryonic stem cells, what happened was, when we started working with the embryonic stem cells, we you grow them in the in the in the, in the lab in the clinic, and when you grow them, they require certain nutrition, which is provided by the animal products. Like you know, uh, you have a feeder layer from animal cells, and then you have uh, serum from animals, fetal bovine serum or fetal calf serum. Now, a very interesting point here, Dr. Kohler, that all these animal products have a antigen, which is called uh, some certain glycans, one of them is new 5 gc Now that antigen, we lost, humans lost that antigen about 300 million years ago due to genetic uh, mutation. Now, whenever we see that antigen in animal products, we react to it, we make an immune response. And if you put in those cells into the human body that are carrying that antigen, they're going to throw it out. Immune system is very smart. It is very specific. It's targeted to any to eliminate any foreign antigen. So, so what we do, what people thought that, oh no, they're causing immune reactions, you know, the stem cells are no good. Embryonic stem cells should be banned. Now people came about with another theory that they cause cancer. Hey, tell me how many babies are born with cancer? You know, as a physician. We are, we're getting, let's say, give a number, 100,000 babies are born every day. Maybe 0.1% get some kind of cancer. That too, not the fault of the stem cells. They develop cancer because of some radiation or drug exposure or smoking or some other, other reason. Not because of the stem cells. Now, when you put these stem cells into an unfavorable environment, I, I don't call them embryonic cells. I call them angry cells because they don't like that environment. So they grow uncontrolled. What, what studies have been done in an immunocompromised host, they put the cells in a, in a host to establish them there. They use steroids. They use all kinds of uh, immunosuppressive agents. So they grow. They, they grow uncontrolled. It's not their fault. So all these things have banned the embryonic stem cell use. And you know we lost an opportunity. And now there are, I think there are a lot of clinical studies going on to see, to reevaluate them because now we grow them in the, in the animal free media. So they don't have the foreign antigen. Two, we are looking at the teratogenicity of these cells in a different way. That, hey, when you put them in an immune competent environment, what do they do? There are a lot of, there is a guy in uh, Lanza who has been uh, uh, a very prop strong proponent of, of the embryonic stem cells. He has done a clinical study where we put the embryonic stem cells in the back of the eye here. And he has not seen any tumors in those five, in those patients in clinical study. And I think it, it, it is just, it, it has been construed politically very much to just kill this whole embryonic stem cell. In this country, I think George Bush did that for political reasons and everybody else followed. So Dr. Bill, if I may interrupt you here and ask two pertinent questions mm -hmm. which, are, which are there in my mind at the moment. Uh, one, of course, when you say that people were trying to cut corners and they may not have uh, moved in the uh, proper fashion. So that's why we, we didn't uh, come uh, out with some uh, good answer uh, about stem cell therapy. Now, my question to you is, I'm sure there would be enough people who would be wanting to first promote this therapy by going ahead in the best possible manner. I'm talking about the research. So do you, do you at this point in time, have some definite data which says that, yes, this has worked very well, which has stood the criticism and, and got published in one of the 
the top journals that's my question to you that's that's one and, okay, and me... I'm, I'm limiting i'm limiting myself to the kidney at the moment because as a nephrologist, I would be interested in knowing whether stem cells are going to be able to repair a given patient's uh, um, kidneys. That's one. And secondly, the point which you are referring to, the various ethical issues. And I, in fact, just before you joined, I had already raised that issue whereby I had uh, um, uh, said that rather than taking accepting blastocyst or the or the embryo as the as the source. How about uh, what we are hearing a lot these days, the induction of uh, pluro, uh, pluripotent cells, and so that the somatic cell uh, transformed into a stem cell, uh, that will carry no, no um, ethical issues, and you have plenty of somatic cells. If your research can take us in that direction, so at least we can eliminate um, the, the ethical issues. And but at the moment in 2020, uh, I basically am wanting to hear that yes, in a few years' time, I should be able to expect that uh, given patients uh, chronically damaged kidneys can be repaired. So that's if, the question I'm asking. Okay, the, the answer to that is if Kim provides me the lab and the resources, I can produce those cells within six months and show you that we have. The stem cells have the ability to regenerate tissue. There are a lot of studies that have been done. Uh, we, I haven't done personally any kidney regenerative function, but we have done some other uh, in the orthopedic area and the dermatology area. I've done a lot of work. There was a gentleman who treated uh, about uh, two months ago. He had his uh, back totally damaged, and for for he would have he couldn't stand for 15 minutes. We gave him right about at five different locations in his hip, about 200 million live stem cells. Verified, absolutely checked that these cells are live. And the guy is jogging now. Uh, I wish I could bring him here on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the show. But uh, again, I mean, I am wanting to clarify a few things for my own self and for many viewers across uh, who are watching at the moment. We uh, need to have more data. You see, anecdotal things, you would agree, do not need that's us right. anywhere. No, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. But that's where I'm saying, you know, um, I am, I'm, I'm, I like stem cells, okay, but I don't have the resources to produce them. Uh, so, I left embryonic stem cell work when I was at Baylor. And then after that, there was a gap of about five, six years, even 10 years before I got back into the stem cell business again. And now there are no resources. I, I don't even have a lab. So we are doing it in clinic. We buy cells from outside the resource, but you know we're not happy with them. Uh, we try to add on the numbers and see, but we don't touch conditions like kidney, for example. The nephrology and the cardiology. There are two areas which are difficult to do because if you give IV injections with the stem cells for these patients, they're not going to do much. So for kidney, you have to get into the, the capsule itself. In the, in the in heart, you have to go into the pericardium, inject the cells, just like a catheter. You know, you have to have a cath lab, a cardiologist involved to do the procedure. And cardiologists don't want to do it because they don't make enough money with, by using stem cells. I mean, if, if they do cats, uh, simple angiography, you know, here they co the, the cost is close to $150,000. With the stem cells, they make only $10,000 or fifteen, so they don't want to do it. So if I can, if I can find a, a, a nephrologist who is willing to provide the patients, and I think uh, maybe we should collaborate down the line in six months, if Kim is uh, willing to open her lab and we get some resource and we could produce stem cells, uh, I think it's doable. Uh, I was you, Dr. Cooler, but I guess he had to leave. Um, some some of our doctors only have a short window of time. When